Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to our last ArtsFest online event of the summer. Today we will be joining Jessica Glazer who will be reading from Beatrice Ward's VJ Day Diary. Please send in any questions via the Q&A box and Jessica will answer them at the end of the reading. Over to you Jessica. Good evening, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Jessica Glazer. I'm an academic from the School of Art at the University of Wolverhampton and I have a special research interest in Beatrice Ward and today I'll be reading her VJ Day War Diary which is part of the Morrison Collection at Cambridge University Library. Additionally, because this is quite a short reading, I'll also be sharing her report on hair and beauty care in wartime, crowning glory from News for the Outpost, the newsletter of the American Outpost. And this is from the Cadbury Research Library at the University of Birmingham. Before I do this, I'm going to briefly explain some of the names, locations and details that are relevant to these two pieces. And as Claire said, if you have any questions, please do add them to the Q&A box and I'll do my best to respond to them at the end of this reading. This evening, I'm going to go from the VJ diary straight into um, her hair and beauty care draw, um, writing. So all of that text will just kind of flow into one and the images that I show you beforehand will be relevant to both of those pieces. Beatrice was an American who was born in New York in 1900. Her mother was May Lambert and Becker, a popular and powerful journalist with a column in the New York Herald Tribune. Her column was called The Reader's Guide and it ran for nearly 40 years. Beatrice came to Britain in 1925 with her husband and by 1929 she'd become the publicity manager for the Monotype Corporation. Uh, they were a leading supplier of composing equipment and typefaces to the printing industry. Beatrice occupied a conspicuous position in this male-dominated industry and she became known as the first lady of typography. During her professional life, she was renowned for her communication skills, giving lectures, writing articles, and that have become some of the most famous 20th century works on typography and printing. But her communication skills were much broader than that. She also used photography, public relations, artworks, the media, and clothing to communicate. What is less known is her commitment to Anglo-American understanding and her charitable and anti-fascist campaigning work during World War II. And this is a picture of Beatrice Ward, I think, in wartime. And this is part of the Ward Archive at Cadbury Research Library. I suspect she is making a radio broadcast here. During wartime, she made um, over 20 radio broadcasts and I think this might be a photograph of one of those events. At the outbreak of war, Ward's work for Monotype had reduced but she remained in Britain. May Lambert and Becker was in New York at this time and they corresponded. Ward's letters became her war diaries and many were published as part published or part published in America by Lambert and Becker's newspaper column or in the 1941 um, publication Bombed but Unbeaten and as well within This Burning Heat, an edited book compiled by Maisie Ward. Um, but her later accounts, including her VJ Day account, were unpublished. This picture that I'm, I'm sharing with you at the moment, I think is quite an interesting one because mother and daughter were very close. And in wartime, how do you, how do you take a photograph of two people that are on different sides of the Atlantic? And this was Beatrice Ward's suggestion. Um, here we have a black and white photograph of her mother, May Lambert and Becker, pinned to, pinned to the side of a vehicle. And Beatrice Ward here in a rather um, voluminous, uh, coat with fur collar and turban style hat and what's going on here is this is a public relations photograph this was for the media and Beatrice was presenting an ambulance um, it was presented by the British War Relief Society of America 
but it was kitted out with um, and paid for by funds that were generated by sales of or partially generated by sales of introducing Charles Dickens, which was a book by May Lambert and Becker and Beatrice and her mother um, raised funds to kit out this ambulance during wartime. Throughout, oh yes, she remained in Britain throughout the war. Um, Beatrice was a writer who remained in Britain. She was an outside observer looking in. She remained an American in England um, during this period and throughout the rest of her life. And an American in England was a title that she did use um, to sign off for various publications that she wrote for. In London, Ward was part of an American expat group known as the American Outpost. They were committed to informing America about what was going on in war-torn Europe and as a result, helping to counter pro-Nazi propaganda. The Outpost produced two newsletters each month, which were sent to its members in America, who were encouraged after reading each issue to pass on the newsletters to friends and thus spread um, the Outpost's view to wider audiences. Despite paper shortages and the challenges of sending publications from Britain to America, the Outpost published 68 newsletters between August 1940 and December 1945. And the Cadbury Research Library has a complete collection of these wonderful documents. Generally, they were between four and six pages in size, mainly text-based, but occasionally illustrated with photographs. Um, and Ward wrote for these newsletters, often anonymously. She dis discussed observations of, of life in Britain and many of her pieces were slanted to also explain why being informed and engaged with World War II was important to Americans who valued the safety and freedom of their country. So I, I thought I'd show you some images that have a relevance, that are pertinent to the, the two readings we're going to be listening to this evening. And the first one, um, a lot of these images and these readings also uh, resonate with the times we're in today. And in her VJ Day account, Beatrice Ward, very, very early on, refers to the protection of statues and particularly to the King Charles statue in Whitehall. She talks about it being covered in concrete and disguised. Now I, I couldn't find an image of that particular statue but what I've got here is a Getty image of um, a statue in Trafalgar Square that's being um, shored up and protected with sandbags and cement. So this must have been very much what was happening to the King Charles statue that Ward is referring to. I thought it would be quite interesting to take a look at some of the newspaper headlines and articles that were um, prevalent at this time around VJ Day and I've deliberately selected the Times newspaper. Beatrice on occasions wrote for the Times and the Times Literary Supplement. Um, her, closest, her close friend Stanley Morrison also had close links with the Times. So that seemed like um, a relevant newspaper to be looking at. And on VJ Day, after VJ Day, the newspaper was very much focusing on looking back throughout the events of the war in Japan, both pictorially and from a kind of day-by-day -day text basis too. They had headlines about Japan surrendering, about attacks on the country being suspended, but they also had headlines that were coming up about urgent need for housing in Britain and how building for that housing need was going to kickstart the community, how kickstart the commerce and industry and how important that was. There were two people that I wanted to just tell you a little bit about that um, Beatrice mentions in her VJ Day account. And the first is Thomas Maitland Cleland. And he was a very well-known, a renowned designer, an American designer, and he was a friend of Beatrice Ward. He was a great flirt. 
he wrote her some very flirtatious letters um, which are in the Cadbury Research Library. He had beautiful handwriting and he visited her in Britain. He visited her um, and her husband very early on in their time in Britain. He traveled with them to France as well. He was known as perhaps one of the first art directors in America. He had very um, general skills. He was an expert in typography, um, in graphic design, he knew a lot about printing, his illustrations and his image making were very distinctive as well and he was a very renowned figure but as I say he was a flirt and I think in this diary account um, Beatrice is trying to get him uh, to perhaps flirt with her mother a little bit or to perhaps to encourage her mother to flirt with him too. The second person that I just wanted to introduce to you and I don't have a picture of this individual was a friend of Beatrice's called Peggy Lang. And I don't know whether she was an American living in Britain or she was British. Um, she worked for the Monotype Corporation for a while um, during wartime. She supported Ward's um, charitable efforts for books across the sea and within the American outpost. She was very close to, to Beatrice Ward. Um, she left the Monotype Corporation and she joined ULPS, which was the Union of Liberal and Progressive Synagogues, um, where she was certainly a graphic designer and she was responsible for designing one of their most well-known prayer books, The Service of the Heart. Um, but unfortunately, I don't have a photograph of her. Um, in her VJ Day um, account, Beatrice suggests that her mother visits her in November um, of that year. And I thought it would be quite, and she talks about how November would be and, and how interesting it would be, um, but also how difficult it would be in Britain. So I've just picked any date in November and gone through some of the headlines in the Times at that, uh, on that day, November the 27th, 1945. And the paper is highlighting um, the need for coal production and plans for coal production, the settlement of um, industrial unrest. Um, there's also a great focus on food reserves in the country and food shortages in Britain, but also in um, broader continental Europe and the need for American food aid um, as well, particularly for Germany, um, was highlighted. In addition to that, the newspaper is talking about the fight for a, to establish a Jewish homeland in Palestine, the fight to establish the State of Israel. In her VJ diary, Beatrice starts to talk about entertainment on VJ Day. She talks about music and she talks about entertainment on the BBC. And the Lambeth Walk is a song that comes up quite a few times. And she highlights Lupino Lane singing the song um, on the radio and how it's become an anthem for their times. She also speculates that the musical from which um, the Lambeth Walk came, so that's me and my girl, would be playing within the Victoria Palace Hotel by the end of the year. So we have here the, um, the programme cover from that production. She also talks about comedians and, and one in particular Stan Holloway, who was an actor, a comedian, and who was renowned for his, his monologues. Um, Holloway was really well known, it might be well known for you, for playing Alfred P. Doolittle in My Fair Lady. And in 1945, he also had a role in Brief Encounter. This is the cover of News for the out from, from the Outpost, the actual issue that Ward's piece on beauty and hair care comes from. So it's um, the seventh newsletter that they published from November 1940. And as you can see, it's quite a text heavy document. Um, so that there were not very many images on front covers of news from the outpost, but this is the front cover. But a highlight for me is her piece on hair and beauty care that appears in there. One image that does appear in a 1941 issue 
of news from the outpost and I, I speculate that this was down to Beatrice Ward and I wonder whether that isn't her figure in the foreground of this image. This is an image of the bombed headquarters, the first headquarters of the outpost, of the American outpost. Um, I don't know whether they were actually working in that building um, at the time of the bombing. I think they might have moved on to their second headquarters. I, I, I don't know, but it was bombed and it was unusable. And as I said, I speculate that this is Beatrice Ward that we're seeing standing in front of the bomb damaged rubble here. One of the other images that I thought I would share with you, and I'm not going to tell you why as yet, we have an image on the left here of um, Mozart. So please just take a little look at his hairstyle while we're on this screen and the kind of smoothness of, of his hair and the rolls of hair um, kind of oh, just above his ears. On the right hand side, we have a 1943, so apologies, it's a little bit later um, than Beatrice Ward's piece on hair and beauty care, but we have a 1943 Woman's Weekly cover. And I think it highlights quite well some of the popular hairstyles of the time that were very sleek looking, that involved lots of rolls and curls of hair, as well as this, this um, turban style head covering. Her hair and beauty hair piece is published within Bombed But Unbeaten, as well as in News from the Outpost. And while I read these two pieces to you, I'm going to leave you with um, another um, page from Bombed But Unbeaten, which shows a drawing of Beatrice Ward by her friend, uh, the artist Eric Gill. So first of all, we have the VJ Doe Diary. VJ Day, 9.30 p.m. My sweet darling, today I was standing at the top of Whitehall where the King Charles statue would be if it hadn't been replaced by a concrete pillbox camouflaged as an information kiosk. The morning's rain had given way to sharp, glittering sunshine, the kind that bounces off the edges of things, Two vast rivers of human beings were converging on Trafalgar Square, up Whitehall and the Mall, and the sun dwelt on their paper caps and red, white and blue streamers and favours. The bells of St Martin's in the field were tumbling over in octaves. Nearby, in a little cleared space, an old bagpiper was playing the Cock of the North, and a Canadian soldier and a girl were dancing a hornpipe with appropriate hoofs. And on the other side, an accordion was playing the Lambeth Walk. There were scores of little children riding above the crowd on their father's shoulders and solemnly twirling wooden rattles. I saw a sergeant in battle dress, carefully manoeuvring through a crowd, a perambulator in which his year old son was clutching a strip of bunting. It was the sombrest festive crowd I've ever seen. And no wonder. All the beer had given out. Also, the news about the atomic bomb struck deep into people's imagination. Among all those thousands of people, I didn't see a single fight or snake dance. But they were all smiling and I became conscious that the expression on their faces was different from that of the VE crowd. It's not as easy to crystallise these impressions from a predominantly Anglo-Saxon crowd of faces which have been disciplined for six years not to betray any sort of emotion, but the enormous number of them was a help and gradually it came over me what the difference was. On VE day, they were being glad that they and their children were not going to be killed. But this time they were being glad that they had stopped killing people. A nobler and deeper emotion. It was quite inarticulate and I believe almost unconscious, but it was there. I heard the King's broadcast at nine o'clock, looking out across my back garden 
as a cloudless sky turned turquoise blue in the twilight. It looked marvellously empty, that sky. Northward, no twinkle of anti-aircraft shells, no horrible blue-white flashes of bombs, no pink stain of fires. Overhead and northeastward, not one of the thousands of balloons of the Great Barrage. I remember all the different flying bombs. I'd watched crossing, the sky, crossing that stretch of sky. It was just the wailing of it. It was just the time of evening when the sirens would be wailing if it were 1940 or 41. This time last summer, the whole of the sky would have been crawling and groaning with hundreds and hundreds of heavy bombers heading for Germany. Now I can look across to Castle Drive and see the whole line of little houses with their windows blazing as if they'd never heard of the blackout. I think the most beautiful sight in the world is a suburban house with lights spilling out of its windows when for years you've seen it muffled against the slightest crack of light. It's strange to think that this is not simply the end of a war but the end of war in any form that we could recognise. Peggy spent her fortnight's holiday here with me and after our good start at Worthing, we had a nice lazy time with frequent picnics. Last Saturday, we took a bus ride to Eastbourne for the day. The news had come through that Japan was surrendering and as a way of celebrating the return of peace, we could think of nothing more appropriate than watching the little motor launch Eastbourne Bell filling up with children and their parents and sailing off in all jollity. Every little ship on that beach had taken part in the Dunkirk evacuation and not all of them had come back. Do please ring up Thomas Maitland Cleland and give him my dear love. I'm writing him and have been doing so for a long time without getting the letter finished. He sent me such an enchanting letter just before he gave that magnificent speech at the American Institute of Graphic Artists. I've seen only extracts of it which appear in the Publishers Weekly and I'm wild to see the whole text. Isn't he the grandest person? As Morrison says, he seems to represent the continuity and vigour of European culture. Why I want you to contact him is because he wrote so affectionately about you and evidently enjoys being with you. Fred will have told you about our party to him. I've had a sweet letter from him. Don't you think that was a good selection of books we gave him? Talking about parties, they've just been giving a fine all-star one on the BBC. Stan Holloway recited a new Sam and all the other leading comedians were in good form. And just before the end, Gladys Ripley sang Edward German's O oh Peaceful England. And the combination of the honeyed tune and the, con and the connotations brought the house down. They ended up with Lupino Lane singing The Lambeth Walk, which is getting to be a sort of unofficial national anthem. They've received, they've revived the show uh, which, for which it was written. And I don't doubt that it will be on at the Victoria Palace when you arrive. I suppose it's much more sensible for you to come over in November though I feel horribly frustrated at not having you here now. I, I pray it will be a mild winter, for there's going to be a coal famine and food shortages and fewer clothing coupons than ever, and the housing situation will be getting ugly. You will see England at its grimmest, but it will be enormously interesting, and you and I can be merry together anywhere. It is just possible that America will be an even more nerve wracking place to be in by that time. I'm thinking of the massive unemployment created by the sudden cancellation of so many war contracts. 
Here, there is not only a vast rebuilding program to absorb labour, but also many very severe shortages of basic necessities. Clothes, shoes and things that have been patched and mended for over six years are now just falling apart. And it's just too many years since one was able to buy a cup and saucer or a saucepan. America has no such set of vacuums to fill and therefore will have to turn to manufacturing luxury goods straight away, which is bad. For unemployed people can't afford to buy them. Well, at any rate, we shan't be flooded with cheap goods from Japan. Today, VJ2 was brilliantly sunny and I spent it mainly in the garden, digging and feeding a bonfire. Our new kitten, Tito, is just beginning to run about. He is bespoke by a family down the road. Mrs. Dimmy's offspring have a good name hereabouts. Patsy has become an enormous cat, sleepy and rather supercilious. I simply can't wait for you to come over. I think of it all the time. What a hug you will have from your adoring bee. And so the next piece is Crowning Glory from newsletter number seven, November the 1st, 1940. The klaxon sounded as I entered our office building and one of the commissionaires took down the board that said, an alert is now in progress and substituted a danger period has been signalled by our roof spotters. The stone stairway resounded with the click of high heels, giggles, chatter, the rustling of papers hastily snatched up on the way to the shelter. Down came the Stenogs, hundreds of them, and clerks and accountants and the rest, of course, as eight floors of business offices debouched onto, into the stream. But it was the girls that captured the eye. For one thing, thrice blessed vanity, mediating long before the war, had devised for each of those pretty creatures a standardised, vivid, implausible facial disguise, as artificial as clothes or forks, and quite as necessary to the self-respect of a bright young salary earner. I will make it universal and familiar now, said good Saint Vanity, looking ahead. As a result, I saw absurdly adorable, adorably scarlet lips, where poor old nature, left to herself, would have set signals of fatigue. Those children had all been snatching broken hours of sleep underground for weeks past after long perilous journeys with trouble already heading in the too early dusk. But the conventional rose flush on each cheek said, trouble? What are you talking about? Yes, it was good to see so many London lips still flaunting fade-proof colour. The eyeballs, I'm told, are the only part of the woman's face that can't be rescued cosmetically from the effect of loss of sleep. It didn't seem fair to test that statement on those smiling young faces. What I looked at with fascination and ever-deepening respect was the typical hairdo. It took a dozen different forms. What was typical about it was its defiance of the laws of gravity and the dictates of convenience. I have since looked up the names of some of these spun sugar triumphs and hand craftsmanship that came tossing and gleaming down the stairs. There was the half Mozart and the double fringe, which has nothing fringy about it and others that might have been carved for a stone angel of Chartres or an archaic Apollo. 
there were smooth, thick scallops that broke in a mist of little curls. There were, but well, but why should I describe what you could see in any lunch hour over there as the hapless stenographers take the street in their living helmets? The point is that each of these masterly hairdos was, and looked, difficult. You can't maintain a half Mozart in its glistening perfection for more than a week, even if you carefully slide fashion each conventional curl at night and cautiously wrap a wisp of Georgette over the whole structure. By next Saturday afternoon, you'll have to take another hour and a half at your local hairdresser's, if he's still there with your gallant young head immovable under the drying machine while the sirens wail. The alternative would be to adopt a style that you could manage yourself. A simple shingle that needs only a stroke of a comb. Unthinkable, of course, for it would mean you were giving way. Some profound mysterious instincts tells young Doris and Connie that they are playing the drummer boy's part in this civilian's war. It is their business to look arrogantly fragile, insolently artificial, absurdly concerned about the powder on their noses and the unrealities of their half Mozarts. Saint Vanity knew what she was about. She never used the word morale. She only sets frivolity like a golden crown on the heads of her little votaries and sends them swaggering on high heels along the grim ramparts of London. The outpost is on the top floor of the building mentioned. So I hope you found those, those two readings of interest. Um, the first was from 1945, obviously, and the other one much earlier in the war. So I was taking you back to a much earlier time. And I think what I'm going to do now is go back to, to Claire and we may have some comments or questions um, that we can share. I will stop sharing the screen at this point and welcome Claire back. Thanks, Jessica. That was great. Um, I have a question. How long did the publications run for? Because they said there was only sort of two a year. There, um, there, were, there were two. They published two every month. Oh, every month, sorry. Every month. Yeah. Um, and they varied in length. Some of them were about four pages. Sometimes they went up to six pages. And they finished in 1946. The American Outpost um, ceased at the end of the war as an organisation. So their newsletters came to an end at the end of the war too. But I think they were quite a remarkable achievement because there were paper shortages, particularly in Britain. Um, and it would have also been very difficult to, put, to, to print and to, to deliver to American memberships that, that kind of quantity of newsletters on a regular basis to individuals. I'm not quite sure how they managed that, whether they shipped them all over to May Lambert and Becker, who then put them in envelopes and posted them to members or whether they were individually posted from Britain. I, re I really don't know, but they ran throughout the war. And at the same time, the outpost were sending regular updates to government departments as well. So this, this wasn't the only kind of method of communication. They were sending um, updates to government departments in Britain and updates to government departments in the US too. So this, this ran throughout the war, but kind of came to an end um, in 1946. Right. So after that, um, what, what other kind of writings did she do um, if these publications came to an end? Um, what, what else did she do after that? At the end of the war, Beatrice Ward went back to working for the Monotype Corporation. Mm -hmm. So a lot of her writing was focused on typography and was focused on the printing industry. But she also 
um, maintained her contact with Books Across the Sea, which was her Anglo-American book exchange, which was founded within the American Outpost. And they would have regular updates and newsletter type publications, which Beatrice Ward would, would write communications for as well. So there's a certain amount of her writing within that organisation that extended beyond um, wartime. She also was a prolific letter writer. She loved writing letters. So she wrote, she continued writing to her mother about her life in Britain. And she also began to, in the 1950s, in 1954, she um, found... Um, another person that she started to correspond with. She started corresponding with Sir Cyril Burt, who was a very eminent British educational psychologist. And she wrote to Burt um, for really the remaining, the remaining years of her life. She died in 1969 and she, were, she was at her desk writing to Sir Cyril when she died. On occasions, she wrote to him twice a day and they had an amazing correspondence between 54 and 69. So she did a tremendous amount of writing to him. Beatrice had also planned to write her memoirs and when she retired from the Monotype Corporation, she actually started um, drafting ideas for her memoirs. So she retired from Monotype in 1960. She continued writing on printing and typographic themes, but she started drafting ideas for her memoirs. And there are some of these notes for her memoirs, which she sent to Sir Cyril Burt um, at the Cadbury Research Library too. So those are the kind of things that she was writing um, after the war. And um, do you think, you know, obviously she, she, this Anglo-American relationship, um, I mean, how, how, how do you think she, she felt about England? Um, you know, um, did she sort of really take it to her heart? Um, you know, what, was she quite sad to go back to America? I, I think she, she loved England. She and her mother were Anglophiles. Mm -hmm. um, her mother in particular wrote about and recommended lots of British authors, very renowned British authors. Um, so they loved Britain. They did love Britain. But Beatrice never became a British citizen. Um, she had the right to remain here. Um, she would go back to America regularly, sometimes up to twice a year which was was quite a feat she'd be going on a big cruise liner she'd be on a cunard boat for example traveling yeah. the atlantic to kind of to go to america and she'd do massive tours of the states for the monotype corporation publicity tours for for them but they were also publicity tours to promote herself really as much as anything she was very seen very much as a celebrity on these tours um, so she was a bit of an outsider in Britain, but she loved the country. She loved Britain. She died in Britain and she spent the majority of her life here as well. I noticed, Claire, we have, um, because we also have the chat box, we've yes. got a, a couple of other um, yeah. A couple of other questions here. Did she write any further on beauty after the war? Um, after the war, I don't think she did. There were a couple of her letters during the war. Thank you for this question, Linda. It's a really good one. There were a couple of other letters to her mother um, during the war where she made observations about beauty in wartime. And one that I can remember off the top of my head, she talked about swapping hair grips for onions and different kinds of hair and beauty products that were on display in ladies' powder rooms in restaurants that she went to. And the kind of things that were on display, I think she recalled as being rather old fashioned, but they'd become popular because they were in such short supply during wartime. She, she talked a lot about clothing. She was a great fan of clothing. She was very interested in her appearance. And 
she talked about clothing. Her mother also talked about clothing. And during wartime, May Lambert and Becker sent her parcels of clothing, allegedly secondhand clothing, though I suspect it was new, but she'd taken the labels off to make it look secondhand. So these parcels of clothing were, were sent to Beatrice by her mother from the States. And there would be huge quantities of nylons, of stockings in these, in these parcels. And she would send different sizes for different friends of Beatrice Ward. So all of the girls that were helping in the American outpost and with books across the sea would be given nylons as a present from May Lambert and Becker. So there was a lot of discussion about clothing. And I think during wartime and before and after wartime, Beatrice Ward used her, her clothing um, to communicate quite frequently. I think that was quite an important part of her clothing. Um, we have another question as well. I read she divorced was there another love interest yes she divorced she divorced frederick ward her husband they had separated in the 1920s they weren't married for that long really um, i think they were apart by about 1926 and they had decided to divorce frederick said he would pay for the divorce but it didn't actually come off until the late 1930s and then when they finally divorced and they divorced in um, Florida. Their divorce came through in Florida. Frederick went and died two months after the divorce. So after having waited years and years to have her legal freedom, um, her ex-husband went and died, um, which was a great shame. He was, he was quite young. I am not aware of any specific love interests though there is plenty of speculation about her relationship with Stanley Morrison, for example. And in the Cadbury Research Library, there are some photographs of some very handsome looking um, young men with Italian names. And they have written on the back of these photographs in adoring kind of English and Italian, um, kind of dedicating these photographs to Beatrice. Now, I don't know who these people are. I, I, there isn't a surname. I have no idea um, who these individuals are, um, but they look incredibly handsome. I, I, I wonder whether they might have been working at the Waldorf Hotel in London during wartime. I don't know. Um, but Beatrice was living at the Waldorf Hotel for some of World War II. And I know they had quite a few um, Italians working within the hotel and with other great hotels. So I'm wondering perhaps whether um, they might have, have come into contact with Beatrice then. But I think she was very charming. She was a very charming individual. And um, she was very popular with, uh, with, this is going to sound dreadful, very popular with men. She, um, she, I would imagine, was quite flirtatious. She got on well with the male do in the male-dominated printing industry. So I don't know of anybody specifically um who she, with whom she was amorously linked and we have another we're being encouraged to celebrate vj day this weekend but for many years we've looked back in horror at the dropping of nuclear bombs your readings demonstrated her utter and understandable relief and i think you said she talked about this being the last war of this type so she clearly understood the severity of nuclear bombs and what they meant was that typical of the time i can't conclusively say yes or no whether that was typical of the time i think particularly in america um there was certainly in the kind of um Las Vegas kind of Nevada area, there was a little bit of a kind of tourist industry that kind of struck up around the testing sites for, for nuclear bombs. So I don't think everybody worldwide um, really recognized the severity of the nuclear bomb. I, th I think Beatrice was quite well informed. She had close contacts with newspapers in Britain and in America. Um, and that was probably 
governing part of her response to to that to that situation in wartime but i th i thought that was a really interesting comment to, for her to be making that that would be the last the last war really um yeah we have a another comment here fascinating thanks i'm writing about caroline norton at the moment some similarities between the two women I'm glad you've enjoyed it i'm glad you've enjoyed the talk and I'd like to thank you all for coming this evening and for the comments and questions that you've raised. It's been absolutely my pleasure to present um, about Beatrice Ward to you. And if you're interested and you haven't heard the previous webinars about Beatrice Ward, there is one on YouTube about her VJ Day diary. And there is also another talk on YouTube about her um, Anglo-American book exchange, Books Across the Sea. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica. Um, I just want to thank you for being part of ArtsFest Online this summer. We've thoroughly enjoyed your talks and um, thanks to everyone at home for watching. If you'd like to see our previous ArtsFest talks, as Jessica said, um, Jessica's and everybody else's who, who has taken part this summer are on our YouTube channel on the University of Wolverhampton's YouTube channel. So please take a look at those. Um, we will be back in the autumn following a short break. So until then, take care and see you all soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.